Hello, um, this is Hisham Matar. I'm very happy to be reading and speaking to you today. My greetings to everyone listening and uh, my greetings to my friends at the Cornet Theatre. And I commend them on trying to find ways in these times to continue to reach out to their uh, audience. Books begin, at least for me, in ways that aren't always uh, clear. Um, in 2016, when I finished writing my book, The Return, which chronicles my journey back to Libya after 33 years of not being able to go there for political reasons, and my failed search for my father, a Libyan political dissident who was imprisoned and made to disappear by the Gaddafi dictatorship, I went to Siena. I spent a month in that Tuscan city, looking at paintings from the Sienese school, um, painters such as Duccio and Simone Martini and the Lorenzetti brothers, uh, Giovanni Di Paolo, um, works that cover the 13th, 14th and 15th centuries. These paintings have interested me ever since I had first encountered them at the National Gallery in London when I was a student some quarter of a century before, when I was 19, the year I lost my father. The time spent in Siena resulted in uh, this book, A Month in Siena, from which I will be reading to you. Um, it's a book about looking at the paintings, about what happens uh, when one attends to paintings like these. And to what extent a work of art is a, a landing place, a place that curates and organizes your thinking and your enthusiasms. Um, it is also a, a way of thinking about loss, of, on love, intimacy, the nature of intimacy, uh, and the nature of our solitude, the relationship between art and death, which is to say, art and life. The Sienese school, as so much else um, at that time, was uh, dramatically altered and changed um, by an event that took place in 1348, one which casts, um, albeit an obscure light, but nonetheless casts a light, I think, on uh, these days and what we are all going through. Um, the chapter uh, that I'll be reading to you from is called The Problem with Faith, and it's about two-thirds of the way into the book. I returned to the Palazzo Publico. This time I did not have Lorenzetti's allegories in mind, but rather the chapel where every surface, every centimetre of floor, wall and ceiling space has been covered in a pattern or a painting. It was added in the 15th century and therefore at least some 70 years after Lorenzetti's Sale di Nove frescoes, which is to say, after the world had undergone a momentous transformation. Notions of life and death were forever altered. A shadow had fallen and has remained here with us ever since, affecting all sorts of human enterprises, perhaps the greatest of which is the imagination. In this time, Sienese art experienced a complete conversion. In fact, the entire history of art and thought and philosophy had taken a turn, and all this was caused by a single event that took place in 1348, a decade after Lorenzetti, Lorenzetti's The Allegory of Good Government. Lorenzetti was still very much at the height of his powers by then. Earlier that year, he, like most of the inhabitants of European and Middle Eastern cities, began to learn of rumours coming from the Eurasian steppe, stories of horrific suffering and death, of entire districts being extinguished, in a matter of days, cities ravished 
The reports were as incredible as they were impossible to ignore. They told of people who had been only moments before in perfect health, suddenly and inexplicably dropping dead. The numbers were so high that corpses had to be abandoned, left as though they had fainted in the middle of the street. Pavements became storage grounds for the dead. And the contagion was quickly spreading. No one knew its cause, and no remedy had proven to have any effect. The mystery was so complete that several wild theories were already in circulation. One maintained that a distant earthquake had cracked open the earth, causing an ancient virulent infection to escape from the belly of the planet. Another had to do with the bitter spirits who had returned in order to exact their final revenge on the living. For, as the more hopeful version had it, the dead had come back not for revenge, but rather out of longing to claim those they loved and take them along to the everlasting place. Whatever the cause, one thing seemed certain. It was the end of time. The Black Death, which is what the plague came to be called on account of the dark blotches that appeared on the skin of the infected, travelled across continents with astonishing speed, certainly much faster than news of it ever could in the 14th century. It moved at such a pace, and the ferocity of its assaults was so stunning as to make one wonder if the pestilence were not a tactful and unthinking intelligence, one constantly plotting how to confuse and overwhelm its victims. But of course it had no consciousness, no ill motive, but rather advanced with outrageous indifference, doing its own good work for its own good end. Unthinking, dispassionate, neither concerned with the possibility of defeat, nor elated by its conquests. Some of the bewilderment that the Black Death had inflicted remains with us even today. We are still not entirely clear what precisely had caused it or provoked its numerous reoccurrences over the ensuing centuries. The abiding theory has been that a ravenous parasitic flea, having entirely destroyed the rat colony, went in search of humans. But a newer one has it that the disease could never have spread so quickly had it relied chiefly on rats. It was much more likely that a human parasite, fleas or lice, had been responsible all along. The parasite would have been both adroit and mobile, riding with its host, infesting clothes, entering houses and boarding ships. It is thought that was what gave the epidemic its peculiar swiftness and agility. But this alone cannot explain its staggering pace, and although scientists and historians today know much more about the events of that deadly year, gaps remain in our knowledge of what exactly took place. We still do not completely understand, for example, how the Black Death travelled from the Eurasian steppe to the Middle East, North Africa and Europe, then further north to Scandinavia, before circling back east to Russia, surviving all the various climatic variations that occur across such a wide geography and range of terrains. In just over a year, it had conquered the known medieval world, reducing a population of each country by an average of 45%. Passing through Damascus, the Moroccan author Ibn Battuta was stunned by what he saw in the Syrian capital. In a matter of days, Damascus went from being the cultivated, prosperous and boisterous city that it was then to a place of horror and paranoia. He describes how at one point at the depth of their despair, the Damascenes began to gather at the capital's great mosque until it was filled to overflowing. 
I was a boy when I first read this account, coming upon it in Ibn Battuta's marvellous book, a gift to those who contemplate the wonders of cities and the marvels of travelling, which chronicled his adventures around the world. I adored it with a passion, but I remember clearly how upset and deeply affected I was by his description of Damascus under the plague. Lying in my room, I kept picturing the people of that city packed in the great mosque, praying in silence. At certain moments, I imagined, the imam must have chanted appeals to the divine in that beautifully melodious Damascene way I sometimes heard on the radio, and that had, on one occasion, moved me to tears. And then I heard the assembly repeating after him each line in unison and with great emotion. I saw them sitting in lines, thighs touching, spilling out of the mosque, very much as when, long ago on religious holidays, my father and I would turn up late to prayer and had to spread our mats on the tarmac under the sky. Ibn Battuta describes how, in order to gain God's favor, the Syrian worshippers fasted for three successive days. Then one morning, after performing their dawn prayer, they left without even collecting their slippers, marching together, barefoot, in the early light, at that hour when the sky was lit but the sun had yet to appear, carrying the Qur'an in hand. At every street they passed, more people joined them, until it seemed the whole city was marching. Jews went out with their book of the law, and Christians with their gospel, all of them in tears, imploring the favor of God through his books and his prophets. For Ibn Battuta's fellow North African, the Tunisian historian and historiographer Ibn Khaldun, and the main concern had to do with the changes the Black Death had inflicted on human society. Civilization both in the East and the West, he writes, was visited by a destructive plague that devastated nations and caused populations to vanish. It swallowed them up and wiped them out. Civilization decreased with the decrease of mankind. Cities and buildings were laid waste. Roads and waysides were obliterated. Settlements and mansions became empty and dynasties and tribes grew weak. The entire inhabited world changed. It is hard not to read in these words Ibn Khaldun's own private lament. The Black Death came when he was 17, and it took from him his father and mother. When he writes that the entire inhabited world changed, he seems to mean that both sociologically as well as personally it is a statement that shines a light into two opposite directions, out onto the world and back into the self. Thinking about Ibn Khaldun here in the chapel of the Palazzo Publico, where I stood surrounded by Tadayo di Bartolo's depictions of the death of the Virgin, pictures concerned with the end of things, a register not central to Sienese art up to then, I wondered if, as that terrible event had determined the art of the chapel, it had not also played a role in the strange habits that would afflict Ibn Khaldun's adult life. The way he changed employment and employer with dizzying rapidity, occupying in a short period of time a variety of administrative roles and high-ranking state positions, including at one point serving as prime minister. He led, and rarely with an obvious purpose, wildly testing and punishing expeditions, and was more than once kidnapped by nomads, who held him captive for several days and then released him stripped of all of his belongings. He had moved from Tunisia to Morocco from Granada to Seville, then back again to Morocco, before returning to Granada. All the while he taught and studied. He constantly fell out with patrons and allies and colleagues. His relentless mobility continued until he settled 
in Algeria, where his nervousness was quietened by the book he now wanted to write, A Comprehensive History of the Arabs and the Barbars. But, he decided, before such a task could be undertaken, he must first produce, by way of an introduction, a philosophy of history. It is ironic that the great mind's most striking achievement was this extravagant introduction, which he wrote and kept on rewriting in order to open another book. The magnificent introduction, which itself evolved into a series of books, was to become his masterpiece. Ibn Khaldun is like a man who arrives at the palace of infinite rooms but gets distracted by the garden. The palace, which he eventually enters, was his planned work, but the introduction was the garden, a philosophical text on the historical method, on how to write a history, how to distinguish truth from error, and how to locate, observe, and analyze consequential turning points in the human story. The 20th century Syrian scholar Sati al-Husri describes the introduction as a general sociology, one concerned with society, politics, urban life, economics, and knowledge. Ibn Khaldun's prepatetic energy, which up to then had expressed itself in a violent re- restlessness, troubled relations, and a propensity for subjecting himself to great risks, now turned into a rare and precious discipline. His witnessing of the tragic events of the Black Death, its at once universal reach and personal affront, had allowed him to glimpse the possibility of the end of things, and perhaps, in so doing, he had resigned himself to writing a beginning, one that, like all introductions, is predominantly concerned with how to start with the redemptive possibility of being continuously initiated into something new, so that its scale and nature may be understood. It is a plan of action that is overtly worried about erasure. The plague, Ibn Khaldun writes, overtook the dynasties at the time of their decrepitude, when they had reached the limit of their duration. According to him, it was not the wrath of God, as Tadayo di Bartolo and his fellow European Christians believed, that had brought on the plague, but rather that human civilization had grown weak. Ibn Khaldun's was a pre-Darwinian, Darwinian view, and he wanted to see the opportunities in the tragedy. To him, it made life seem as if it were a pristine and repeated creation a world brought into existence anew. This helped him to uncover a new field of study, sociology. According to the English historian Arnold Toynbee, Ibn Khaldun contributed a philosophy of history which is undoubtedly the greatest work of its kind that has ever yet been created by any mind in any time or place. I wonder if this would have been possible had the Black Death never occurred. Lorenzetti, still safe in Siena, learned that Sicily had fallen. It was obvious now that there would be no escape. Fear and hysteria echoed throughout Siena. Some ran into the countryside, while others, believing themselves safer inside the city, rushed to enter through one of the nine gates that surrounded Siena like open mouths. The whole city began to feel like a diseased body gasping for life. The painter, along with his family and apprentices, remained within the city walls. The Sienese, like their medieval European Christian counterparts, suffered under the conviction that all diseases came from God. They took the Black Death as proof of their guilt. In William Langland's Piers Plowman, a Middle English narrative poem from the time, a work that was to bear an influence on Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, the matter is put succinctly. These pestilences 
were for pure sin. The Black Death was therefore ordained and just. Tuscan poet Petrarch writes from neighboring Florence, O happy people of the future, who have not known these miseries and perchance will class our testimony with the fables, we have indeed deserved these punishments, and even greater, but our forefathers also have deserved them, and may our posterity not also merit the same. The Church encouraged this supernatural explanation. Many priests refused to bless the infected. Most of the believers devoted themselves to prayer and penitential practices, repairing churches and setting up religious houses. The papacy became more powerful in material wealth as well as in cultural and psychological terms. Fanaticism was on the rise. One had either to surrender or rebel. The need for scapegoats became irresistible. Jews, Muslims in Spain, lepers and other outcasts were regularly attacked. The situation became far worse for Jews when a group of them confessed under torture to some fanciful plot to infect the wells. Indeed, the effects of the Black Death in Europe were in some ways like those of a civil war, like those very civil wars taking place at this moment in Syria and Yemen and, on a smaller scale, in my own country. The plague in Europe provoked violent sectarianism and social division. I had retained an image from one of Petrarch's letters in which he describes some of the effects of the Black Death, which he witnessed. Houses were left vacant, cities deserted, the country neglected, the fields too small for the dead and a fearful and universal solitude was over the whole earth. As in today's civil wars, the plague gave criminal groups an opportunity to dominate. In Siena, they looted the deserted houses and robbed the living. The city began, began to resemble Lorenzetti's The Effects of Bad Government. And there was that other picture that had also made its way into my mind and for some reason remained there. All the citizens did little else except to carry dead bodies to be buried. They took some earth and shoveled it down on top of them and later others were placed on top of them, and then another layer of earth, just as one makes lasagna with layers of pasta and cheese. Even when I had first read this all those years ago, it did not sound like Petrarch. I did not have his register, and yet I had persisted to erroneously attribute those words to him. The peculiar image back then and well before the revolutions and the wars, did not ring true. Its close juxtaposition of food and death, of play and burial, of nourishment and a mass grave, made it seem gratuitous. It made me think less of Petrarch. And now after discovering that the quote indeed never belonged to him, its lines continue to live with me. Their weight and meaning growing over time, perhaps because my consciousness in the interim had been altered, imprinted with my own images of mass graves, not once from history, but from the present. Today, it has become impossible not to consider the idea of mass burials. And it turns out that they are more than they appear. They are motivated by expediency, obviously, by one, but one could think of other, easier ways to get rid of the dead. There is the sea, but that is some distance from Siena. There is the alternative of fire, hygienic and almost automatic, in the sense that one could light the match and walk away, not even needing to look back. But something about the history of putting to rest or disposing of large numbers of bodies has favoured the earth. Maybe there is more to it than just convenience. Perhaps the word is what is tempting. After all, to bury is to deny, to attempt to make something disappear. An individual 
may be honored by a dignified burial, a handsome headstone. But once you get into the large figures of 20 or 100, or, as in the case of Abu Slim prison in Tripoli, where, under the orders of the Qaddafi dictatorship, on the 29th of June 1996, and in the space of minutes, 1,270 political prisoners were executed and buried where they fell in the prison yard, things become complicated. The act then becomes one concerned with satisfying at least two conflicting objectives. To make the evidence disappear, but also to gather it in one location, thereby making it more effective and augmenting the scale of the accomplishment. And perhaps some fragile but still burning virtue in the mind of the executioner who is also at that moment the survivor, is strangely consoled by the fact that these disorderly bodies, now jumbled one on top of another, are at least not going into the depths alone. Some in Europe did rebel. To them, the sudden and unexplained dominance of the plague was final proof that the divine was neither good nor merciful. They claimed Theocydides as their guide, vowing to get out of life the pleasures which could be had speedily and, and which would satisfy their lust. They got drunk, stole what they needed, and fornicated wildly without inhibition. A London reporter wrote, In one house you might hear them roaring under the pangs of death, in the next tippling pouring and belching out blasphemies against God. From here on, European Christianity and culture were altered. It was as if Europe had woken up and discovered it had all along been living in the kingdom of death. It wanted this to be expressed in art. It feared forgetting. It trusted in that fear and wanted to communicate and propagate it. The plague had traumatized the imagination. Everything became stained with guilt. Similar responses of hedonism and spiritual culpability did occur in the Muslim world, but only on the fringes. The main response was a deterministic one. Muslims viewed the epidemic as a calamity, no different for a storm or a flood, one to be resisted and endured. It was not sent by an angry god, but rather decreed by fate which governs the order of things. No one was to blame and, as in Ibn Battuta's account of Damascus, people of different faiths often found comfort and solace in solidarity. Yet a doubt from then on grew about the extent to which human beings could shape their future. Faced with the specter of death, both Arab and European societies became more vulnerable to fatalism. Their imagination and the very structure of their values shifted. This is why Albert Camus was interested in the plague. He trusted its extremity. He had faith in its power to illuminate human nature, to expose it as though it were a masked figure whose true character was mysterious. What Camus feared most was also and what Camus feared most and was also most fascinated by is the utopian. The curse of the world, he believed, is the idealist. One could no better reason with an idealist than with a plague. The Black Death continued periodically rearing its head around the world across the following four to five centuries. The last recorded occurrence in Europe was in 1720. The Balkans and the Middle East endured spells well into the late 19th century, and it is thought that the pestilence that devastated India then was a latent relative. It is impossible to discern the overall number lost. What is clear is that the Black Death of 1348 was the most devastating incident in human history. It claimed more lives than any other single event. It shaped our attitudes to death and dying and, by implication, 
to life and living. The flowering of the Renaissance and the Baroque took place in its shadow. Michelangelo, Rembrandt and Vermeer were all periodically threatened by it. It is thought that Titian died of it. And it entered their minds, cast a die on their thinking, and made death a familiar and inescapable guest, the silent companion who will inevitably have the last word. The imagination began to focus on the end of things. No thought is born in me which has not death engraved upon it, Michelangelo wrote in a letter to Vasari. Further north in Venice, a city that was particularly badly hit, losing up to 60% of its inhabitants, Jacopo Tintoretto painted painfully moving works of suffering and healing de dedicated to San Rocco, the saint protector against the plague. In the middle of the 17th century, the Flemish painter Van Dyck moved from the Italian port city of Genoa to Palermo, arriving just as the Sicilian capital was falling victim to a reoccurrence of the plague. Notwithstanding Van Dyck's delicate refinement, he remained and made the horror his subject. For many artists, the sight of death came to seem a rite of passage, a vehement education into the mortal fragility of human life, a window onto the fugitive impermanence of the spirit. Death was the prize. It is behind Nicola Poussin's landscapes and Auguste Rodin's figures. It is in Dante and Beckett. But perhaps no other artist has wielded the psychological effects of the Black Death used it so profitably and inventively and with such relentless force more than Caravaggio. David with the head of Goliath derives its power partly from the fact that David knows, regardless of his temporary victory, that he will follow. After 1348, art changed because man changed. As it entered Siena, one of the first lives the plague claimed was that of Lorenzetti. The pandemic had killed many of his contemporaries too. Gone were their expertise and their ability to train the next generation. Most of the young artists now were without teachers and financial support. The economy had been devastated and with it private patronage of the arts. The religious fervor inspired by the suffering of so many instilled a powerful commitment to the church. A few years later, in 1355, the rule of the nine magistrates ended. The clergy now were the principal clients and had a great deal of money and influence on matters of governance and of art. They determined what was painted the artist who was assigned to decorate the walls of the new chapel in the Palazzo Publico, Tudaio di Bartolo, had a big task to fulfill. He needed to revive and carry forth the Sienese tradition, as well as reinvent it and make it more adaptable to the tastes of the new patron. Lorenzetti's client was the state. Bartolo's was the church. He ended up doing something altogether different. It is a performance and an ingenious one at that. Through its grandiose certainty, its sheer assertiveness, it manages to satisfy the clergy while at the same time expressing the problem with faith. That faith, any kind of faith, and regardless of how adamant it might appear, is a space of doubt. It was as though Bartolo was echoing that mischievous statement of Boccaccio's the Florentine poet and Petrarch's friend and correspondent, who had also witnessed the Black Death and was disturbed by it. A seeming thing it is that whatever we do, it be begun in the holy and awful name of him who was the maker of all. An element of that sardonic rebellion was here in the chapel, albeit faintly, perhaps even unintentionally, through the double-edged gesture of assertive magnificence.